Welcome back, everyone. This is our last talk before the panel. And then if you uh, wanted to ask any more questions, sorry, too late. We've already closed and taken all the ones we're going to ask. So too bad. <laughs> uh, Benno has done a whole bunch of things. But he is also one of the members of the FreeBSD core team and went through all the effort was. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, and went through the effort of transferring it to the power, sorry, porting it to the PowerPC. Uh, now he's going to give us a rundown on uh, WebAuthN, which should be pretty interesting. Thank you. Um, hi. Yes, so as you can tell, porting FreeBSD to the PowerPC has everything to do with uh, authentication on the web. Um, <laughs> Before I get started, I'd also like to thank the Federal uh, Liberal Party for getting all of their onness out of the way so I can actually focus on this. <laughs> um, so authentication is fun, as everyone knows. Uh, for most people, you know, for a long time, passwords have been the way we've done authentication. Um, passwords are a type of authentication factor that people describe as a shared secret. I know it, you know it. If I can prove to you that I know it, then you let me do stuff. Uh, and that's all well and good, but passwords uh, can have problems. Um, it generally falls over when someone else gets a hold of the secret that's been shared and so then they can pretend to be you or some security researcher uh, manages to get in and dump the auth database and then you find out they weren't hashing things or you find that they weren't doing it very well and suddenly you're a statistic on haveibeenpwned.com. Um, so how do we do better than passwords? So the obvious solution that people tend to come up with is multi-factor authentication, um, which is where you combine multiple factors together. So we've described one, part, one factor being a shared secret. Um, other factors that have been used in the past are things like, you know, little RSA key fob, you know, six digits, type it in, then you lose it and have to get another one or the battery, whatever. Um, there's also biometrics, uh, fingerprints, uh, face, facial scans, all that kind of stuff. Um, a whole bunch of other forms of one-time keys. Uh, so the RSA key fob is a form of time-based one-time key. You've also got the TOTP type keys that you use with Google Authenticator. Um, and you, know, you can use SMS two-factor authentication, or you could not. Um, so, but one other form that is kind of useful is forms like public key cryptography. Um, Public, the most common one that you'd associate with this is things like SSH keys or um, uh, some kinds of public key certifi certificate authentication like SSL certificates. Um, you create a public-private key pair, you give the public part out to the public, you keep the private key, and that way you can prove that you have the thing that proves that you are who you say you are without having to let go of the secret part, in theory. Um, and the nicest, the nicest thing about public key ones is that in a lot of cases they can replace passwords. You don't need to have, you don't necessarily need to have a second factor in there unless you want to be, well, depending on how paranoid you want to be. Um, but how do you do this? Um, especially how do you do this in the context of something like a web application? Um, integrating extra factors into web applications has always been somewhat of a problem. RSA uh, tokens, you need to go buy RSA's validation gear, you need to buy all the tokens, you need to ship them out, you need one token per service, which is a pain, so on and so forth. You could use SMS second factor, or you could not. Um, the problem with SMS two factor, despite the fact that there are sort of underlying issues with you know, people stealing your phone number if they decide that they want to break into your site, is that you still have to send all the SMSs and all that. That costs money. You've got all the infrastructure work for that kind of thing. Uh, Time-based one-time passwords, TOTP type ones are great, except that the problem is that with, you know, if you're a sensible person and use a password manager, that password manager often also offers to store the time-based one-time password stuff for you, which means that both your password and the hashes needed to generate the one-time password are in the same place. That's not as good. Um, Deploying hardware tokens as second factors would be really nice, except that until now, the really the only way to do that has been through things like U2F in Chrome, which was the only browser that supported U2F. Um, speaking of U2F, so the FIDO Alliance um, came out of some work that started between Ubico and Google in about 2011. Um, and U2F is the universal second factor protocol. It was designed to try and make it easier to integrate this kind of stuff. The problem was that it just didn't really take off. Um, FIDO owns this U2F spec. Um, 
Fido also owns a bunch of other specifications, which is why I wanted to talk about the stuff that I'm talking about today. So Fido 2 is a combination of, two, of a couple of other protocols, one of which is CTAP, or the Client to Authenticator Protocol. This is the protocol that already exists that U2F uses to talk between a browser and a hardware authentication token. The other one is a W3C spec called WebAuthn. And what WebAuthn does is define a common API for browsers to talk to authenticators that web apps can leverage. Um, so a quick demo of what WebAuthn looks like. Um, if I do, oh, wrong window, that one, wrong direction, that one. So this is, um, this is a demo application that you can actually get from, the, uh, from Ubico's Python FIDO2 library. Um, you'll notice that I have two available actions here, registering and authenticating. If I attempt to authenticate, um, it will tell me that my connection is not safe. It'll tell me that there is no credential available to authenticate because I haven't registered any yet. I can register one. My, um, what you can't see is that my YubiKey, which is in the side of my laptop, has started blinking because part of the important part here is that there is user interaction to make sure that you're not being automatically played with. Um, and you probably can't read that, but it says that the registration was successful. Um, and now I can try and authenticate. Again, I have to physically interact with the device to do that. And authentication is successful. I can, it's now done. That was not particularly exciting, but that's kind of the point. We want it to be easy to do. Um, so just to give you an idea of what was going under the hood there, he said, trying to get back to, there we go. It was something like that. Um, and that's a lot of stuff, so I'm going to go through it a little bit slower. Um, so as you can see here, there are three parties involved. Uh, the, the client is the one where the browser is. The, the authenticator is the hardware token, and the notion of the server has been abstracted out to the notion of a relying party, the party that is relying on the authentication. Um, an important thing to note here is that the authenticator does not have to be a YubiKey. It can be anything that supports CTAP. It doesn't even have to be that, though. It can be anything that is a secure element. The defining characteristic is that it can generate keys in such a way that the private key never leaves the device, and it can ship the public key out so that other people can use it. Um, so what happens here, the relying party, the server, generates a challenge and a user handle for the new account. Um, it sends, uh, the, the user handle is like a user ID, but it doesn't have to be human readable. So it can be the, you know, the underlying primary key for the user, or it could be a whole bunch of other things. Um, we send the challenge and the, the user handle along with the relying party ID, which contains the primary domain of the relying party. Um, so in this case, you know, we could be ubico.com, but it, like if we send example.org, then internal.example.org will be accepted as a valid origin for that relying party. Um, so the client will validate that against what it sees and reject it if it doesn't match. Um, and that, pre that prevents a fake site from registering credentials for your real site. So if you are pycon2018.org and someone tries to register a credential that isn't from that domain, it won't work. Um, so once we've done that, the client generates a client data object which contains a challenge from the relying, the, the challenge that we just received and the origin as seen by the client. And these get hashed and sent to the authenticator along with the user handle and the relying party ID itself. Um, the authenticator prompts the user for consent. That's an important step to avoid automated attacks against the authenticator itself. And then it creates a new key pair for this relying party and signs the client data hash and the new public key with its attestation key, which is a key that is specific to that device. It, sen it sends an attestation object back to the client and that contains a whole bunch of stuff, but the important bits here is it's got a hash of the relying party ID uh, the credential ID, the public key of the new credential, and all of this is signed with the, uh, the authenticator's attestation key. And so it sends the certificate containing that public key with it. Um, the client then passes that attestation object back to the relying party along with the client data object whose hash it got, it's sent to the authenticator. 
And then finally, the relying party receives that, verifies that everything's fine. We verify that it verifies that the origin that the client saw is in fact the domain that we think it should be, which prevents person in the middle attackers from faking logins to the site. And since it's signed, it can't be, it, it's, can't be faked. Uh, we, we verify that the challenge we got is the same as the one we sent, which prevents the request from being replayed or monkeyed with. And uh, we also can check the certificate of the, uh, the authenticator itself, the attestation certificate, because that can be signed by a, uh, a root certificate owned by the vendor, so we can actually see whether, for instance, it is a genuine YubiKey and not something else. And so finally, if everything's fine, then we store all that and we can use it for later authentication stuff. Um, so that was pretty long it involves. So just the short version for things. We generate a challenge which prevents replay attacks. We validate, the, the client will validate the origin which prevents phishing. Um, the authenticator checks for user presence and consent, um, avoiding automated attacks against the authenticator itself and preventing silent tracking. The authenticator creates a key pair. The, the private key never leaves the authenticator. Um, and then the relying party then verifies the attestation signature to make sure everything's on the up and up, which again prevents phishing. Um, and it proves that the private key is safe and not coming out. Um, so at this point I was going to do, yeah, so assume that I just did the authentication bit there, because I'm just going to keep moving. So the authentication sequence looks very similar to the registration sequence. Um, we, we generate the same kind of challenge data that we did before, although in this case we include IDs of the certificates, sorry, the credentials that we're willing to accept uh, signatures from. Um, the client data, again, looks very similar. It gets sent over to the authenticator. In this case, the, instead of signing it with the attestation key that is permanently within the device, it will sign the whole blob with the private, the private key of the credential key pair that was made previously. Um, the signature and everything is, is sent back along to the client. The client passes it on to the relying party and the relying party verifies everything. So again, this looks very similar to the registration process just using the uh, underlying private, the credential private key rather than the attestation key. So again, we generate a challenge preventing replay attacks. The client validates the origin again, which prevents phishing. The authenticator checks for user presence and consent, which prevents silent tracking and automated attempts on the authenticator. Uh, the authenticator checks and signs the relying party ID. The, um, the credential is restricted to one relying party, so you don't end up sending the same credential out to multiple places. Um, the relying party verifies the signature, which prevents phishing attacks, and it prevents person in the middle attacks. So all of this, um, if you want to have a play with it, you can find uh, a bunch of implementation for the server side logic, and also examples of various other bits in the Yubico Python FIDO2 module, that's on PyPI as well as available from GitHub. Uh, so looking at some of the code in the example, um, this is what happened when I pressed the register button. Uh, this bit of JavaScript um, gets kicked off. You can see it's hitting an API call on the server to kick off the registration process. Um, it then um, decodes that and calls uh, this navigator.credentials.create. This is one of the two API calls that WebAuthn specifies. Uh, so this is for creating a new credential. Um, once it gets that, um, so what the, the options dictionary that, come, that goes into that looks like this, and this is taken straight from the, the W3, W3C spec. Um, what it gets is the RP field is information about the relying party. Um, the user field is obviously information about the user, things like username, uh, the user handle that I mentioned previously. Um, it can also contain things like uh, the full real name of the user if you want to put that in there. Uh, the challenge is just a sequence of bytes. Uh, the public key credential parameters are a set of uh, parameter groupings for what kind of public keys you accept. You can define what algorithms you want to use and things like that. 
The timeout is how long the uh, authenticator should wait for the user to validate that they're there. Uh, exclude credentials allows you to say, I already have these credentials for this user. If you have any of those, don't bother creating a new one. Um, authenticator selection criteria. Uh, no, I have forgotten that bit. I am sorry. Um, sorry, there's, there's a lot of stuff here and I'm kind of new to this one. Um, so the selection criteria, I believe, allows you to specify whether the key must be resident in the device or whether there's, there's a, another mode that I'm forgetting. Uh, the conveyance preference indicates whether you're allowing proxies to get in the way of things uh, and the extensions is, funnily enough, for extensions. Um, once we have done all that, then we hit another API endpoint, which allows us to send back the information. This is the sending back the attestation object part of the, the transaction. And then once we've got that, then we deal with the results of that, whether it failed or succeeded. On the server side, um, the, the FIDO2 module gives you a FIDO2 server object. Um, you give it your primary domain, which in our case here is localhost. You know, you will not do that in, in outside of testing things, I'm sure. Um, and we have our relying party ID that we're going to be sending through to things. Um, this, was a, this is a Flask app, so we've got a, a Flask app decorator there. Um, we are doing pretend usernames here. We're not actually using usernames in this example, so we've just made them up. Um, the credentials item in the register begin call is just simply an array of credentials that we've created because this demo thing just keeps the credentials in memory. And then we, generate, we pull the challenge out and then remember that for later and then send the result back to the browser. On the registration completing side, uh, we take the response that came back. We register complete will um, will do all the validation aspects of it for us and throw an exception if any of them fail. Um, we then append the credentials to our, our data store and return that everything worked. Um, on the authentication side, again, it ends up looking very, very similar. You've got, um, this is the JavaScript side. Again, so the other call that we have here is navigator credentials get. This is the authentication end of the WebAuthn API. Again, we have one of these uh, large complicated options dictionaries. Um, challenge, timeout, RPID, all very similar to what we saw before. The, the challenge is the byte sequence with our random challenge value in it. Timeout is how long we want to wait for the authenticator to receive user input. RPID is the relying party ID. Allow credentials in this call says, here are the credentials that we expect this user to have. And so we can then make sure that the, the, the authenticator can make sure that they've got one. It's worth noting here that we, you do support multiple authenticators. So if you have multiple um, hardware tokens connected to your, uh, connected to your browser, then it, the browser will go out and look for all of them and, and say, do you have this credential ID? Do you have this credential ID? And pick the one that's got it. Um, user verification, you can require a, a more stringent level of user checking. You can say um, the user must be present, which is, you know, I, when I touched the YubiKey key that indicated that I was there. You can also ask that the user be verified, um, which would be more like um, having a, su a subsequent authentication step like a, entering a pin into the device or a touch ID or something like that. And extensions, again, are for extensions. So when we receive that, we decode it, we check, uh, we send it, and we send the results back to the server, and then deal with whatever response we get back. On the server side, again, we literally just call into uh, the the library will create the auth data structure for us if we want to do that. Again, credentials is just the list of credentials we've already created, and then on the other side, we just check everything and make sure it all works. So I have a slightly more complicated version of this that I can show off. Um, what I have on this one here is an implementation of the, the, the Django example polls app that I've stuck some very loose authentication around. So I can tell it I want to log in with Authenticator and it will say no credentials available. Strictly I should probably enter my username there to do that too, but 
Again, I don't have any credentials there, so we'll just have to log in the old-fashioned way. So we have the polls here. Um, so you know, we, we we can see the result. We can see the options that we have here. Um, <laughs> And we have an option to register an authenticator. So we can hit that, and it will tell me to touch the blinking authenticator, which I will now do. And so we've now registered that. So if I log out, uh, I can now do this and log in with authenticator, and it will ask me to touch the blinking authenticator, and there we are. And over here, we can see that I now have uh, in my user entry in the admin state thing here, I have a user authenticator that I have registered today. Um, what I can also do if I want to is I have another YubiKey here. Um, and I can put that in there. So I can register a second one. So we've now registered two authenticators. If I log out, I can log in with my second authenticator. And that works. And if I reload this page, I will now see that I have two of them. So if I, for example, lose one of them, I can delete that. Yeah. Go wait. Log out. And then when I try and log in with the one I just deleted, assuming I can remember which one I deleted, there we go, invalid state error, the user attempted to use an authenticator that recognized none of the provided credentials. And so, but I can still log in with the other one. And there we are. So, I go that, yeah, so, based on that, we get to go away there, right, so, well, best practices when you're implementing WebAuthn, always allow multiple authenticators. Um, the, 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 the sad thing about hardware, physical devices, is you lose them. So allowing multiples uh, does that. Um, at Ubico, when we, when we first join, we're given two YubiKeys, and it's like you, know, you keep one with your laptop and you keep one somewhere else so that if you lose your laptop, you can still get into all of your accounts. Um, Allow users to label their authenticators. I didn't have that in this app because this app was, as you can see, top-notch quality work done in a very long time frame with plenty of attention to detail. Um, but if you are implementing this, allow users to label their authenticators so that they know which ones they are. So if they lose, if they lose one, they know which one to, to knock off. Um, store the credential data verbatim. Don't bother trying to process it or anything. It's not meant to be introspected in a serious way. So just I, the underlying data type you know, that I'm using in my Django app there is literally a, a, just a, a, a bytes field of some kind. Um, you can, if you want to, check the attestation certificates that come back when you register credentials to make sure they're coming from devices that you trust. This would be in the case, uh, this would be when you're sort of going up maybe one or two levels of paranoia, but if you, if, you're, if you are worried that there is someone out there using faked authenticators, then you can try and make sure that your attestation certificates are coming from a root certificate that you trust. So if you only wanted to use YubiKeys, you can make sure that they're all signed by the Yubico cert. If you only want to use, say, Google's Titan keys, you can make sure they're signed by, by Google. All of those are fine. Um, these links here are the, uh, the first one is the W3C Web Authn spec. Um, it's full of dry spec language. You're probably not going to find it a fun read, but it does have some useful information in it. The second one is the Python FIDO2 library that I uh, showed you earlier. Um, browser support for Web Authn. Uh, Google Chrome has it from version 67. Uh, Mozilla Firefox has it from version 61. Microsoft Edge will have it from version 18, which is the next version that will come out. Apple's Safari. But there is hope. Um, this WebKit bug is their tracking bug for implementing WebAuthn. They actually do appear to be working on it. From what I understand, which is absolutely nothing coming from Apple itself, it's just what people have told me, 
Um, they're first going to be implementing it on what they term local authenticator, which refers to their touch ID, uh, face ID based secure enclaves on things like phones and touch bar equipped Macs. But they do have tracking bugs in there for implementing uh, USB and NFC and Bluetooth uh, authenticator protocols. Um, and yes, even more information on all of this can be found at Ubico's developer program website. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And your amazing mug. A mug for a <laughs> mug. <laughs> um, we do have a couple minutes, so we can break out a question or two. And I think we've got to start one already. Yeah, that was quick. <laughs> um, so besides all of the questions that I want to ask you, because there's so many, <laughs> um, how many keys can you actually generate onto one of these devices for each individual site? As in, if I go and plug this in and register for like you know, three different sites, am I going to hit like a key limit or how is that actually? I don't have properly? an answer for you on that one. I can find out. It will vary depending on the, the token itself. Um, okay. So different tokens have different hardware, different hardware has different storage capacity, so on and so forth. Hi, Beno. I'm Hi. Philip. I love the talk. Uh, question about, since you had that browser support list, Yes. what does mobile look like with like the Phaeton keys and that whole universe? Um, Okay, so mobile, you are looking at NFC and Bluetooth LE as your most common things. The YubiKey Neo supports NFC, which will work on Android handsets, I believe. Um, iPhones are an interesting issue in that regard. Um, at the moment, if you wanted to do that, you would need to use Bluetooth LE, um, which I believe is one of the reasons why the Google Titan one does have Bluetooth LE. Um, Ubico, being a relatively paranoid organization, does not like Bluetooth LE as a carrier for security, things like that. But will the browser support it? The browsers it? should support it, and once and there, the, that WebKit tracking bug that I mentioned does mention both iOS and macOS. So once the iOS support for that shows up, um, which I doubt will be iOS 12, but could be a point release on that or iOS 13, then you should get, assuming that they go ahead with it, you should get support for all of those. Uh, Benno? Yes. Um, thank you very much. It was a great talk. Thank you. The hardware authenticators, of course, are in a different class to the software authenticators. Yes. And um, we know that People like GitHub, for example, are recommending to use Authy, which is essentially a software authenticator. Mm -hmm. um, we also know that in your talk, you talked mm -hmm. about labelling actual hardware devices yes. in case you lose one. Yes. Um, what, is there an API to essentially query, number one, the device label, mm -hmm. uh, but number two, the class of device, so that you can say, actually, that's a software authenticator and this is a really secure thing for your bank details, for example, and we're not accepting it? Um, okay, so... The first part first, is there a way to, hang on, sorry, the first part was query the label. Query the label. Um, there isn't, you can probably get a serial number out of them, but I don't know if that gets exposed via CTAP or anything like that. Um, I think the label you would put on it is really more like you stick a sticky label on your key um, and then put that label on the thing. So in my case, because I've got like a 4C Nano is my sort of main one that I, just lives in my laptop, I would probably label that one laptop and then label the one that goes on my key ring, key ring. Um, but you are free to call them whatever you like. You can call them Esmeralda or you know, Fred or what. You know, I don't know if this goes into a naming your pets kind of thing. But um, on the other hand, uh, querying the capabilities of a device, there are, you, can, you do get some information about the device back in the attestation object when you register. Um, again, what you could do is make sure that it's signed by the right certificate. Like, uh, Ubico will never put out a software authenticator like that. Um, so, but um, yeah, I don't know what Authy does in terms of what its protocol is, so I can't tell you whether it's using that under the hood, like whether it would actually integrate with WebAuthn in that fashion, or whether it's more a kind of time-based one-time password or th those, ver those varieties. If there's one more, we can fit it in. Oh, yep. Hello. Go ahead. Hi. You mentioned that verifying user presence is important, like with the yes. tab. Do you have any concerns about the fact that the user can't tell which site they're verifying? Like if I open a background tab, can I trigger one of these requests and convince the user to tap 
from a malicious site without their realising? That's a very good question. Um, the answer is I don't have an answer for that, but you have given me questions that I'm going to go ask the relevant people about. Cool. I'll give you my email Excellent. address afterwards. I'd love to hear Great the answer. Question. <laughs> Great question. Thank you very much, everyone.